Hi everybody, today I'm going to be looking at embryology and the Quran. To clarify something, I am not bashing, criticizing, refuting or debunking the Quran or Muslims or the part of Islam that is religion. This video is only intended to show miracle seekers that the Quran is a book of signs and spiritual guidance and not a science textbook. What I will do is examine the claim for the miracle of embryology in the Quran and try to show why it is not a miracle at all, what is accurate and what is not, and lastly, where this claim comes from and how people, and particularly Muslims, are being intentionally cheated and misled. We have three different sources. We have the Quran itself, we have the Sunnah, and then we're going to be looking at other external sources. Now, typically, miracle seekers will find a word or two in the Quran that can be suitably adjusted to fit a scientific meaning. This word, with its new meaning, is not necessarily substantiated in the Sunnah, but that does not deter them in the least. As an example, you have words like, I don't know, let's jump and I somewhere in the Quran. These words, jump and I, are then modified to clearly show that the Quran author authors knew 1400 years ago that the Summer Olympics will be held in London. But the situation is somewhat different for embryology. Here we have multiple surahs and ayat all going into more detail and using defined words, which is why I will examine this miracle claim here. Now I want to point out that I am not using so-called hate speech sites or anti-Islam pages, but only the Quran and Sahih Hadith. So what does the Quran itself say about embryology? Well, it's a bit of a mixed bag. In the Quran we find several different methods of creating humans, like from earth, from a worthless fluid, from sounding clay, extract of clay, from nothing, from water, from dust, from drop of semen, from seed or fluid or drop, or even from a single dead person. So we see there is a lot to choose from. Sometimes these forms of creation are mixed up, as I don't really know how Jesus or Isa was actually created according to the Quran. In 359 it says dust and in 1922 it says birth. Of course you can argue that what is intended to be shown here is that Allah first created the basics and then implanted this being into Mary or Maryam for the conception part. But why go the roundabout way in different surahs when a more precise and accurate description would have made life easier for the interpreters of this book and ultimately more befitting a God? Even people 1400 years ago would have understood this. I think we get the picture. Not a lot in the Quran is straightforward and easy to understand as you always have to keep in mind the rest of the book which might just explain an ayah that is not so clear or demands an explanation. As with other topics, embryology is scattered throughout this book. Here are some examples of where embryology is mentioned. Now I found 2313, the most complete one, but in general we see there is no consistency or order in this. Now this means that we get varying descriptions from different areas of the Quran all concerning embryology. I will not go and argue here that Surah 40, Ghafir, Ayah 67, is a formal internal contradiction because it goes straight from the Alaka stage to baby, but we'll take this as a lapse of memory. After all, we're only human. If something does remain unresolved in the Quran, we need to refer to the applicable sections in the Hadiths and Tafsir, the Sunnah. As we have different levels of Hadith, I will only consider Sahih, the authentic, trusted and canonized box. Bukhari is the biggest of the six canonical Hadith collections of Sunni Islam. Looking at Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Malik's Muvata, etc., we get the following summary. Now, I will not even go into the function of the angel in Islamic embryology, which would put a full stop to any serious analysis right here and now. So the summary of the events is some sort of liquid is ejected from the man and mingles with the menstrual blood of the woman, forms a clot and then a lump of flesh. This embryo is then growing bones which get covered with flesh and then develops into a fetus, which is eventually born after a term prescribed. The three stages in the beginning are called Nutfa, Alaka and Mudga, which last 40 days each. Then you get the Adam, the bone stage, and the covering of the bones with flesh. Finally, you have the Tadil, where the organs are formed and the embryo is finished, ready for delivery. Does this description constitute a scientific miracle as claimed? To establish this, I have developed something I call the Three Truths Test. To qualify as a scientific miracle, the description 1 must be without alternate explanation and previously unknown. 2. Must be in the Quran without re-reinterpretation and re-re-translation. And 3. 
must reflect reality. Easy. All we have to do now is go and run embryology through the checkpoints. So first, is there an alternate explanation to the embryology in the Quran, or was embryology really only discovered in the last few decades? The process of fertilization by two genders and subsequent reproduction of life for land-going animals has been around for 300 million years, and it has had that long time to develop. Ever since humanoids evolved, the question of life has been scrutinized and finally came out of the superstition phase around 500 BCE, when the Greeks and the Hindus formulated the first theories on this. Because of the frequent miscarriages, Arabs and other people on the planet had ample opportunity to actually see what had initially formed and thus called it a lump of flesh, because that is what it looked like to them. Then we have the Greeks, Hippocrates, Aristotle, Galen, and some Hindu medicine from people like Acharya Sushruta or Achaya Sharaka from around 600 BCE. Uh, by the way, if, if you want to check up anything, all, I've given all the links at the bottom, or the left or the right, depending on where YouTube is going to put them next, but at the moment they're at the bottom, so you can check on, on anything that I say here, that this is not just a figment of my imagination. Dr. Lucien Leclerc writes in his Histoire de la Médecine Arabe about Harith ben Kalada, who studied medicine at Jandishapur in Persia, where the translations of Hippocrates, Aristotle and Galen were readily available in Syriac, a language which actually is quite similar to um, the normal Arab. A cousin of Muhammad was Nadr ben Harith, a highly educated man who spoke Persian and studied in Persia. They were both in the immediate surrounding of Muhammad and actually friends. This explains how the medical knowledge made its way into the Quran without Muhammad himself knowing anything about medicine. Then we have second century Jewish doctors such as Samuel Yahya Yehudi who used similar names for the stages of embryonic development. And the Quran copies the stages of Galen's disseminy almost word for word. So we have a number of alternate sources and explanations for the description of embryology in the Quran. The claim for a miracle is thus unfounded as it fails checkpoint number one. And by the way, all this was noticed not only in the 20th or 21st century by infidels in the West, but 700 years ago by Muslim doctors like Ibn Qayyim. Let's tackle checkpoint number two. Is it really in the Quran? I could actually leave this out or forfeit this as a discussion on the exact meaning of the words used here is futile. The word nutfa simply means semen and the meaning has evolved during the last 30 years into more like a mingled fluid to better suit miracle seekers. Alaka has three meanings, leech, clinging thing or coagulated blood. For centuries the accepted translation was C, coagulated blood, until Abdul Mayid al-Zindani started organizing conferences for Western scientists and provided Dr. Maurice Bukai with sufficient incentives to give the Quran a scientific brush-up. Although this has never been officially confirmed, a similar incentive is probably what got a doctor and former professor of anatomy at the University of Toronto to call it a leech-like substance, instead of the clot of blood. But I'll get to that later. The last word, mudga, is used to describe a chewed lump of flesh, a creative, creative interpretation as it actually refers to a small piece of meat. So the words originally used in the Quran have different meanings than those attributed to them by miracle seekers, but let's say that test two is half past. Checkpoint three is what the Quran describes correct. Let's start with the production of sperm. In 86.6 it says that he is created of water pouring forth coming from between the backbone and the ribs. Because this is not actually quite correct, this is explained by claiming that the tissue the testicles are formed from is from the upper abdominal area during the fetus stage. Well, not only is this untrue, it is also unlikely a god would be talking about semen in a grown man being produced by organs which 20 odd years ago were near the kidneys. Hmm. Then you get the explanation that the terms are actually colloquial words for loins or penis and the backbone is the coccyx, and all is well. There is, however, a much easier explanation which does not require this kind of brain contortioning or brain acrobatics. Hippocrates. A thousand years before Muhammad, he proposed a diffusion in the brain passing down the spine through the kidneys into the penis via the testicles, and that accurately matches the picture in the Quran. Now we get to the actual reproductory phase. 
Now there are four essential terms, elements and functions required here. Number one, a sperm cell, the spermatozoon. Number two, the female egg, the ovum. Then the fertilization, which merges the two, resulting in a zygote. Are any of these mentioned in the Quran? Nope. If they were, anyone would accept the Quran as a book containing a scientific fact.